All right, well, I'm glad to have a big group out here. Um, never sure when I'm you know, putting these together months in advance what kind of weather we'll have. Uh, so uh, when we get into this time of year, I tend to try and keep the, the, the walks a little bit shorter in case it's a day like yesterday where it's cold and wet and just kind of nasty. Um, so we're, we're really going to be we deal just in our screen garden, our xeric garden, and our rooftop talking about plants that are mostly, not entirely, there's some outliers on the list, but mostly from Mediterranean environments, uh, desert environments, places that, that generally are fairly dry, soils are, are pretty well drained, um, you know, things that don't necessarily like uh, all of our, our moisture, uh, both uh, coming down as for rain and as humidity. Um, humidity can be a real um, problem with, with some of these desert plants, even in well-drained soil. So I'm going to talk about some that um, have, have performed very, pretty well for us, some that we know will do well, some that we're still uh, waiting to see how they'll do over the, over the long haul. Um, so as always, if, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to, um, to pipe up with them. If you have any observations that reinforce what I say or that contradict what I say, please um, share those with us also. Uh, gardening's all about uh, personal experience. Everybody has different, different um, uh, experiences with, with the plants and sometimes things that we have success with, uh, y'all don't or vice versa. Um, and we're lucky we've got, we've got Charlie here who's our garden leader for, for some of these areas so he's got some, some probably got some insight to add to these, uh, these things also because he's out there dealing with these plants on a regular basis um, in the garden. So before we get started are there any questions? Alright we'll jump right into it then. Some of these places we are going uh, pathways are kind of narrow. Um, I'll, I'll try and get stand if I'm talking in any of those spots in a place where, where everybody can see me. Please do try and stay out of the beds. Um, sometimes we need to kind of spread out a little bit, but um, you know, if you can't see the plant right while I'm talking about it, uh, just you know, uh, as you're going by, you, uh, you can look at it and um, we'll wait for you to catch up at the next plant. All right, let's get going. Okay, the, the first one on the list is, is a prickly pear cactus. Um, had to put at least one cactus on, on a thing if we're going to talk about uh, desert type and Mediterranean type plants. Um, the, the Opuntia macroriza, macroriza means big root, and if you've ever dug one of these up, it does indeed have um, pretty big <laughs> chunky roots under there. Um, Opuntias are, are, for the most part, many of them are pretty happy here. Uh, they do like well, fairly well drained soils, but, but actually most of the punches will grow in, in typical garden soil, as long as it doesn't stay waterlogged. Um, this is one that, that ranges over a pretty wide area, including up into Idaho. And if you've ever been to Idaho in the winter, it is cold in Idaho. Mm -hmm. So uh, it is extremely, extremely cold tolerant. Um, and Jurassic Plant's got some small spines and, and glycids, which are the little things in prickly pears that if you've ever touched them that stick in your fingers and um, really irritate you for a long time. But then it also has these really nice long um, uh, uh, spines too. Get a little bit of a reddish tinge to them. Uh, it's one of my favorite prickly pears because I like the, the looks of those spines, those long little bit um, brownish red uh, spines up against the, the um, blue green pads. Big yellow flowers followed by uh, red prickly pear fruits, which are delicious. Um, if you've ever eaten prickly pears, uh, this is, a, I think, a pretty good one. Um, maybe better as juice with a little bit of sugar in there. A little, little insipid, but um, apparently lots of great, uh, I don't know, nutrients and antioxidants and all kinds of things. Um, prickly pears are real easy to, to propagate. Um, if, you, if you have a friend who has one or, or you, you, you know, see one in the wild that, that's pretty good size like this, all you have to do is break off a pad, let it dry out for a few days, a week, a couple weeks, um, whatever you want, and then just stick it in some well-drained soil and, and the pad will, will root from there. Um, I often get questions about prickly pear cactuses, about the morphology and what you're looking at. The pads are stems, they're modified stems. Um, they do have leaves. Uh, if you come out in the spring and you watch most prickly pears, you'll see these little um, kind of uh, fleshy uh, cone-shaped structures along up there. 
and uh, those are actually the leaves. They drop off very early in the season. Some prickly pears don't really form them at all under most conditions, but um, these are these are actually stems that you see. Questions, thoughts, observations? Are any native to this area? I think so. There are some native to this area. There's a puncha humifusa, which is a, a small pad um, that kind of lays on the ground for the most part. And there's another one. Can anybody help me out with the other one? I, do. I know a puncha humifusa, but I, can, I cannot think of the other one. And we do have uh, we do have that one. Oh, oh, it was right there. <laughs> Shoot. Uh, we do have it uh, in our winter garden. Uh, if you go in there, there's the big Pinus uh, uh, Waits Golden on the left side as you're going um, going this direction, uh, and it's it's under that we have um, some, some of that. Mark, have you any advice for a neighbor who needs to remove a well-established clump from under the mailbox? <laughs> oh, wow. Hire somebody. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, what I usually do with when I'm trying to remove uh, uh, prickly pears is, you know, if I want it gone, the whole thing, if I'm not trying to be gentle about it, I'll go in there with a shovel or a rake, you know, a, a hard rake or something like that, and just kind of knock it back and then pitchfork it or, or rake it and get it out, the bulk of it out of there, get the tops out of there. And then you can get in there and dig up pretty easily. But, you know, it's fleshy, so you can, you know, you can whack it out. Wait till you're having a bad day and, you know, go <laughs> beat the heck out of it. It's uh, pretty satisfying. What about the spineless? What about the spineless? Um, that's a uh, plant gum goes under variety of names. I can't remember where we have it right now, but uh, Opuncha elisiana or Burbank spineless or um, some other names like that. It's a, it's a great plant, beautiful. Um, you don't get this contrast between the spines and the, the pads, but you have those lovely pads, a um, little bit safer. There are still the glockids on there, the little those little hook-shaped pieces that will come off in your fingers and uh, irritate you for days on end. Um, so you do have to be careful. It's not completely friendly, although it does have relatively few of those glockids compared to some other ones which can be covered with them. Um, but it's, a, it's another, it's a great plant, yellow flowers, um, really neat. Uh, where, where I used to work um, in our children's garden, we'd go in there and carve little faces in the, the pads, you know, little smiley faces, and so you'd have all these little smiley faces all over there. You don't want to do that with this one. It's, it's not quite as friendly to, to do that with it. Right. How do you handle those fruits um, to, if you want to harvest them? If you, if you want to harvest the fruits, get a good pair of leather gloves, yeah. leather work gloves, harvest them with that, and then, um, you know, what I always do is just kind of cut them in half and then scoop them out. Uh, but and I don't know how you deal with them if you're if you've got a whole bunch and you want to you want to deal with them inside. I don't know if you drop them in you know you blanch them or something like that. I'm not really sure. Um, does anybody else know? Anybody? I was done just much? wondering physically. You know, can you rub off those little? Because I know they've got. Like, you can rub off most. I mean, they're they're not so bad. They've got some of those glasses, but I I mean I pretty regularly come out you know when there's lots of fruits and we'll pluck them off these without gloves or anything on and you know I get one or two little. Uh, spines in my hand. Do these grow in the mountains at all? Um, some of the punches will grow in the mountains. This one would uh, would go pretty far up in the mountains, I and mean, maybe not at the coldest areas in, in North Carolina, because you've got not just the the cold, but the wet in the cold. But um, probably one like Macariza would would you could get you know pretty far up there. Sounds like somebody with deer problems looking for spiny plants to <laughs> pale the deer on. Now this is a little different than the Apuncha in that it needs a little bit more of a specialized uh, sighting uh, to grow it. It's Cystus salviafolius, the, the sage leaf um, rock rose. And there are several different types of plants called rock roses, but um, Cystus is one of the larger ones, nice shrubby plant. It needs very, very well-drained soils. Uh, cystus do not tolerate wet soils. Don't buy a cystus and plant it in North Carolina clay because it will die, and it will die quickly. Uh, might as well just you know toss your, uh, your your cash in the trash can because it will not live. You really need to have kind of a raised bed, really well-drained soils. Our beds, throughout all the areas that we're really going to be talking about, have uh, aren't just. Uh, mulched with, with permatill, but we have 
uh, about 30% permatil mixed into the bed. So, so it's very, very well drained um, uh, soil. Um, Cystus salvifolius grows as kind of a, a low shrub. Um, it can get to uh, well, uh, five or six feet tall if it's really happy. Um, but that's kind of unusual. It's got these uh, small, um, very uh, kind of rough, rugose, uh, netted um, uh, leaves, kind of medium green. During the winter, you see it turn some of these, you can get some burgundies and reds and oranges in there. Um, but it is an evergreen shrub. Um, in the spring, you get uh, good size, two and a half inch uh, white flowers with a yellow uh, throat. Um, they're bee pollinated. Bees really love them. They produce a lot of pollen, so the bees get a lot of energy. Um, uh, they produce a lot of nectar, and, and apparently honey made from rock rose is very good. I, I have never lived in an area where uh, there were enough rock roses around to get um, honey from rock roses, but I'd, I'd love to try it. Um, it. It can be a little bit of a temperamental plant here. If, if uh, you know, even in really well-drained sites, I've, I've had them. Uh, where they just they, they look like this, and then two weeks later they're completely dead. Um, ours seem to be pretty happy. I think this is one we grew from seed. Yeah, this was seed, and, and it was when it was planted in 2007. It was it was a one gallon plant, and you can see it's it's been pretty happy uh, in, in the, that time here. Questions or thoughts? Yeah. Now the one over here is a different species. Yes. And that was real happy for a few years, and now. Yeah. See, most of it is gone. Most of it's gone. Okay. Yeah, and that's and that's kind of yeah. typical. Um, you know, unless you're living in uh, Southern California or in uh, the uh, you know Italy or somewhere like that, uh, you tend to have that a lot. And I'm not sure what causes it because a lot of times you'll have two plants side by side. They get the same weather, same drainage conditions, and one goes downhill quickly, one doesn't. Um, so you just hope that it does this and has suckered out a bit and has some other um, some other life there. Other questions or thoughts? What was done to the existing soil? You said there was 30 percent permatill in here. How deeply was the existing tilled and um, You know, I can't answer for sure about these. I'm somebody else who was around. This was this was done just before I started here. Um, typically what we do uh, say down here in the Xeric Garden when we redid this, um, we'll go through and we'll, we'll tear up and we'll till the beds pretty well. Uh, we'll put in a layer of the, um, the soil wanna be, we're gonna be using, the permatill um, and soil mixture that we're gonna be using. We'll till that in and then we'll do the soil mixture, we'll berm up on top of that. And that way you never have this, just this really sharp division between one type of soil and another type of soil, because where you have um, that, that real division, water doesn't move through. So I, I, I always, when I tell people what to do in their yards, even if you're just adding compost or anything to, to your garden, um, it's never a good idea to just take your existing soil and throw a bunch on top of it. What you want to do is, is till up your soil, put a layer of, of whatever you're going to put on there, even if you want raised beds uh, pretty high, put a layer of that on there, till that in, and then put the then put more of the material on top. That way you get this, this profile where it kind of gradually goes from the, the wonderful fluffy material that you're, you, you're putting in your bed down to the existing um, um, soil that's there. Uh, so, so water will move through better, because otherwise you can get a, a kind of an impervious layer when you, when, if you don't do that. So I'm assuming since everything's doing so well that that's what was done here. Other questions? So, um, a Texas plant, I didn't mention the, the cystus is, is kind of a, that's a true Mediterranean. It goes North Africa all the way around the Mediterranean to, to Spain. You know, it does a pretty much an entire loop. This is a southwestern um, um, plant, Dazzlerian texanum. Uh, the name kind of gives it away. Uh, Dazzlerian are, are in the, fam the, the same group with uh, agaves, uh, that type of thing, you know, very similar. Uh, you get these strappy leaves, um, and Dazzlerian always have uh, little spines along the, um, the uh, margins. And, and I always find the, the spines on, on this one especially interesting. Most plants, when they have the little spines along the leaf, they're all facing one direction, and you know, if they're, if they're kind of going down, you can, you can run your finger along there down that way and it doesn't get you or they all point up and you can go the other direction they'll get you. This one, it'll, they'll, they'll all mostly um, kind of go up, but every once in a while there's ones that go down on either side. So if, if you're like me and you pet plants all the time, which I do, they'll, uh, it'll bite you um, pretty, pretty quickly. 
Um, Desilarian, I think there are very few plants uh, that give you the, the architectural feel and, and uh, look of a Desilarian. Um, there are some others, but there's something about those, those um, spines along the side which seem to catch the light and are really nice and gold against the, the green of leaves. You often get a little bit of twisting in the, the leaves. Really a, a striking um, plant. They're great in, in um, containers, great in beds. Um, Desilarian, they like uh, full sun. Uh, some of them will take some shade. This one really likes likes um, a really sunny spot, uh, but they'll tolerate a little bit. Uh, they don't need that perfect drainage that the cystus. Um, they, they like it, but they don't need it. And you can grow them with other perennials if you have a nice fluffy perennial border, or something like that, where where your drainage is pretty good, but it's a nice rich soil. Um, they'll do well with there, and I think they, you know, it's kind of nice with. Uh, some perennials climbing through there uh, during the growing season and, and uh, uh, flowering in there. Of course, then you got to get them out once they die. How cold are like, you? Um, Desilarian Texanum has been um, pretty perfectly hardy in Zone Seven. Um, I, you know, if you go, I don't think it'll go a whole lot colder than that. But um, I'm not I'm not necessarily certain of that. But Zone Seven, you should be should be fine. How old is that plant? Uh, oh, this plant was, um, I tried to put that on here, we don't have it. This plant was, was put in the ground here in 2008, but it was dug from the arboretum. And we don't, I don't have a, we didn't have a record of, of uh, where it was, um, when the original plant was planted. Um, this is, you know, if you've got a, a small, say a quart uh, plant of this, in pretty good soil, if a happy plant, uh, you're probably looking at um, five years maybe to get this. Yeah. Other questions? They tolerate our acid fine. They, they, it's nice to mention they will tolerate a more alkaline soil. They, they where they grow it is it is much more alkaline, but they, they have no problem with the acidity here. Okay. Next plant is is a sable miner. This is one of the ones I'm kind of cheating on. Uh, not really a um, Mediterranean plant uh, or desert plant uh, at all, although it will tolerate those conditions. Um, this sable miner is one from McCurtain County, Oklahoma. It's one of the, the westernmost uh, populations of uh, sable miner. Uh, tends to stay much smaller than, than all uh, most other population ecotypes. Uh, there was uh, actually just an article in the Southeastern Palm Society um, journal about some of the palms at the sable miners that are grown at the bamboo farm down in, in Georgia where they planted a bunch of sable miners from different areas of the country all at the same time. There's one from Florida, Apalachicola or sometimes Bluntsville, sometimes called, that's even smaller than McCurtain County, but McCurtain County um, after 10 years in the ground uh, is, is still under uh, 48 inches, significantly smaller than, than all the other ones except for Apalachicola. So it makes it a little bit easier to use in the landscape. Um, we call them dwarf uh, palmettos, but in reality, uh, say the North Carolina um, ecotype of, of sable miner often grows to 10 feet or more. So that's, you know, dwarf is a relative term. Um, certainly smaller than the uh, sable palmetto. Um, the uh, McCurtain, the sable miner, McCurtain County, stays small. In in the wild, it grow, sable miners grow from very, very dry, sandy soils to rocky, um, poor soils to really wet, almost uh, swamp-like conditions. So, so they're really tolerant of a wide range of conditions. They grow from full sun to to pretty deep shade. Um, so, really, they're they're one of the toughest plants. Um, it was interesting that article. Um, it, and the, the bamboo garden in, is in Savannah, Georgia. And if you've ever been to Savannah, it's, it can be a pretty tough um, place to garden if you're not doing a lot of care for your plants. The, I think there were something like 50 or 60 uh, plants installed in the ground, groups of, of, from different, different areas. Um, they, were, they were, you know, watered the first year. And then after that, they never got supplemental water again. They lost one plant out of that planting and uh, so, so it just goes to show you what a tough, tough, easy plant it is. Um, you get uh, stalks of kind of uh, fluffy, creamy yellow-white flowers um, and then uh, the seed heads on there. 
generally with the sables, uh, the, the mother plant, uh, if you get the seed from there, it will uh, stay uh, pretty true. So if you take seed from this and sow it, you will get dwarf plants. Um, it, it is pretty reliable uh, in that, that respect. Um, nice blue-green foliage, very few pests. One of the few pests you do see on, on sables uh, and on many palms are scale. Um, usually they won't kill the plant, but they can really disfigure them and slow down the growth pretty bad. Uh, this one um, is doing pretty good. We do have some out here with scale, but uh, um, the one, if you get them, these different ecotypes, if you're really into palms and you get different ones, Louisiana, this, the, or sometimes Sable Minor variety Louisiana, um, but the Louisiana ecotype, which is the largest growing, the quickest growing of the Sable Miners, and often gets a trunk and grows up tall, is extremely susceptible to scale for, for whatever reason. Um, whereas this McCurtain County tends to not have such a problem with that. Hmm. Questions or thoughts? Um, you know, we have a lot of seedlings, that, maybe not of that plant, but of other Sable Miners. Mm -hmm. And I've noticed mine at home a lot. It's okay, it's native plant. Oh yeah, I like it. I mean, I'll give them away, you know. Yeah, you, you can get seed, if you if you leave the, the fruit stalks on there for a long period, they can, um, you can start getting some seedlings popping up around, um, certainly, and the only real downside to them, uh, in my mind, is they are a pain to get out. If you don't get them out quickly, man, that root goes way down, unless you've got really nice fluffy soil, which apparently Charlie does, because no, he, he has no problem getting them um, They can be, they can, you leave them in there for, for a little too long, and boy, it's, it, it's, uh, they've rooted into the other side of the world, and they're not, you can't pull them out. The birds eat the uh, seeds? Um, birds do move the seeds some, yeah, but you can see that if you have a lot of food plants like we do here, uh, it's not that highly desirable because of the fruit still out here in, in January, but they will eat it. Um, if you are, if you have sable miner and you want to grow it, uh, usually what, what we'll do is we'll, we'll take the seed, um, either clean it off beforehand or just take the whole fruit, throw it in a bag with some water, kind of crush it up to get that, the um, flesh off of it and let it soak for 24 hours to a week, you know, however long, and then we sow it and generally they'll, they'll pop right up. You get a, you know, if you just cover a whole container with a layer of seed, you know, put some soil on top of it and they'll all pop up. And um, you can let them grow in that, that way pretty tight for quite a while and then pull them apart when the roots are thick and wiry. Other questions? All right, next plant is an asparagus and this is a true asparagus, asparagus denudatus. Um, not to be confused with asparagus dentatus, which is um, the common asparagus fern. This is denudatus, the naked asparagus fern. Um, it gets that name because typically it does not have a lot of leaves on it. It's usually just bare stems. If you looked closely at this as you went by, you might have noticed that there are um, quite a few leaves on our plant. If it were growing in South Africa, which is where it's from, it would not have all these leaves because it does everything it can to conserve water. Um, and one of the ways to do that is to, uh, well, it reduces its leaves, so when it does have leaves, they're very, very small, but then also has green stems that can photosynthesize, um, but don't have the, um, the water losing uh, properties of, of the leaves. So it's a, it's a drought adaptation. When you put it here, we have plenty of moisture and no, no pro don't have those kind of problems. It'll keep its leaves out a bit more. Time out. Pardon? Time out. Time out, yes. Hopefully that's just a passenger train. All right, there you go. Um, makes a nice shrub, uh, about four feet by four feet or so. Um, once it's established, it gets a real nice blue-green color. Uh, uh, you can see that here, um, really quite attractive. Little off-white flowers, aren't very showy, um, but then it often gets uh, bright red fruit in the fall, which, which are uh, very nice. Yes? Does it need a lot of sun? Does it need a lot of sun? Um, it does prefer sun, but it will take a little bit of shade. Yeah. Um, people hear the fern in there, asparagus fern, and think uh, uh, shade, but really it's um, more closely related. It's, it's more related to agaves and, and dazzlerian than it is to um, any type of fern. Questions?
hardiness. Cold hardiness? It is easily hardy in zone seven, perhaps hardier in, uh, hardy into zone six. But definitely rock hardy here. Other questions or thoughts? All right. Next plant is right behind everybody over here. You can, you can move, Benny, if you want to. <laughs> uh, this is a Ceanothus. Um, Ceanothus are, are mostly native to the, um, uh, the western part of the, the country in uh, some of the, the dry coastal areas. Um, there is one native to the east coast, Ceanothus americanus, or New Jersey tea, uh, which is a nice little shrub with little rounded uh, clusters of white flowers. Uh, but the reason people mostly love Ceanothus is they have incredible blue flowers. And, you know, blue is, true blue is a hard flower color to find in, in the garden. And Ceanothus have, have some really true blue flowers. Uh, most of them absolutely detest uh, the high humidity, detest the uh, uh, rainfall we have here. They just do not do well. The one exception is Ceanothus thersiflorus, and by extension, some of the uh, Ceanothus thersiflorus hybrids, um, which includes the Ceanothus ex delineanus uh, and some others. But Ceanothus, Ceanothus thersiflorus is, is about the best. This is a form called Variety Repens, uh, which grows in California in very restricted area, just, just one or two counties in, um, in California around Monterey, uh, maybe just north of Monterey. Uh, makes a low creeping plant, sort of, um, when it's young. And often if you see it, uh, if you look at uh, nurseries that, that have this, they'll say it grows one to two feet tall. Not really. In reality, it can get six or eight feet tall, but the, the species grows 10 or 20 feet tall. So it's all relative what's reaping but it will tend to be more wide than tall. Beautiful glossy green leaves, uh, nice green stems, it is evergreen, and it gets the most, most uh, just beautiful soft sky blue flowers. It's really striking, especially against this glossy dark green um, leaf. It, it, really, it really pops against the leaf. Um, it does, uh, it does grow in some shade, which is different from some of the Ceanothus uh, that, that really require full sun. Um, so sun to, to part shade. Uh, it's been very happy for us. Um, we grew this from seed in 2008. Um, so, so you can see it's been pretty happy. But uh, this, this form in particular, even more so than just typical Thersiflorus, seems to really tolerate uh, humidity and, and moisture uh, more so than other ones. Yucca madrensis, and this is a, a, a yucca that is, is um, restricted to a pretty small area of um, the Sierra Madre Occidental Mountains in, in um, uh, Mexico. Uh, Chihuahua, as my son likes to say. Um, it's a, a, a trunk-forming uh, yucca, like you see some of the other ones behind here. Um, although it's a little bit smaller than, than, than some of these really large ones. Um, tends to, at, the, at peak, be about 10 feet tall. <laughs> um, but really nice, broad uh, uh, blue-green uh, uh, leaves that are spine-tipped, although not quite as deadly as some other ones. I wouldn't want to fall into it, but not, not too terribly bad. Um, relatively slow growing, tends to keep a pretty dense head, which is nice for a, a tree type yucca. Um, flower stalks tend to stay kind of almost down in the, the leaves, so it's really uh, kind of get the leaves, get the flowers all together. It's not one that, you know, is way up above it, like, like that veterinaria, like some are. Um, this is, uh, this grows up above five, six, seven thousand feet. It is exceptionally cold uh, hardy. Um, an exceptionally cold hardy uh, tree yucca, perhaps perhaps the, the hardiest of them all. Um, so 
even up into the mountains, it, it should do uh, very well. A little bit difficult to find still in the trade. It's not not. Um, it's from a restricted area. It's not widely available, but um, you can find it if you if you look around at some of the specialty mail order places. Questions? I wanted to put this on on the list because uh, um, not that it's at its peak right now in terms of looks, but but I do find it interesting. Um, okay, who knows the difference between a pelargonium and a geranium? What what most people call geraniums, the big red. Um, flowers that you have to deadhead three times a day uh, that you grow as an <laughs> annual. Um, those are pelargoniums. Pelargoniums and geraniums are closely related, but the true geraniums are mostly hardy plants. Um, make great garden plants. Um, so, so you know, look for those. But the the pelargoniums are mostly uh, plants we use as, as annuals. The zonal geraniums, things like that, um, use as container plants. Well, this is a hardy pelargonium um, here, uh, which is kind of neat. Um, has a kind of lacy uh, dissected foliage, uh, nice uh, kind of blue green during the, the uh, summer, um, but can, can go to um, kind of plums and reds in the winter. Uh, over most of the, the summer, long periods, It'll have these kind of narrow petaled uh, magenta or you know whatever color that is, pink flowers um, uh, that that are really nice. It's it's kind of an airy light thing. You can often find this plant being sold as an annual for hanging baskets and for window boxes and that kind of thing, where it's beautiful hanging over. But if you put it in the ground in a well-drained uh, location, uh, it actually makes a, a really nice uh, landscape plant. I think we've had it out here since yeah since 2008. It's been been out here and, and done well. Um, it does have slightly uh, sticky uh, foliage. If you've ever, you know, deadheaded your geraniums, uh, your pelargoniums, you know they kind of have that, that sticky uh, hairs all over them. This is kind of that same thing. Um, has has a little bit better fragrance than um, pelargoniums. You gotta excuse me. I worked at a nursery where I had to deadhead the stupid things <laughs> all summer long. I, I cannot stand them. Um, so I really like this one. Um, doesn't need to be deadheaded and keeps going. Keeps going strong. Um, they're from South Africa uh, in, in some really inhospitable sites. So the fact that they will grow here uh, is, is pretty remarkable. And they are available out there, but you often, like I said, you often have to look for the at the annuals, not the, the perennials, um, because since it's a pelargonium, everybody thinks it's not hardy at all. We don't know the specific epithet. It's it's a hybrid. Oh, well, yeah, and I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the parentage on, is on it. Okay. Now we're going from uh, you know the U.S. and, and Europe uh, over to Australia. This is one of the tea trees. You can see it's kind of a uh, it's been kind of a crazy growing plant for us. It does not want to be in that corner. It wants to get out here uh, in a little more sunlight. Um, this is a Leptospermum, Leptospermum minutifolium, as it has minute leaves. Um, it's, uh, it grows in a couple of the, the um, states of, of Australia. Uh, tea trees, Leptospermum, are, are used for um, uh, some beauty products. If you get tea tree oil, that's Leptospermum that you're getting. Uh, this is, was, has been surprisingly hardy. We've actually propagated this and planted some out in the, a more open location. The reason it was planted back in this corner was because we didn't think it stood any chance of growing here, really, and um, it has surprised us. Uh, we probably need to start doing some shaping on it now that we know it will um, live here. Um, it's been relatively vigorous as well. It was I put when it was planted. It should have been planted in 2007. Um, and you can see it's from a, a little tiny plant, and you can see it's it's grown quite a bit. Um, small white flowers, which are, are kind of nice. It's in the the myrtle family. So if you've seen um, just the the common uh, myrtle, Myrtus communis uh, uh, flower, the little white um, flower, it looks very similar to that. Uh, I'm told that they will grow in deep shade. Uh, we put it out in full sun. That may be deep shade in um, Australia, which is, you know, kind of the equivalent of um, full sun here. Uh, it can be pretty brutal there. Um, and it naturally grows uh, uh, in fairly wet soils, kind of swampy spots, but it's, it's perfectly adapted to um, uh, dry uh, uh, 
very dry uh, Mediterranean-like soils as well. But this is one we're definitely finding much harder than we thought. Um, probably one that we'll, we'll start propagating and, and uh, uh, trying to get out there because we do think it's, it's kind of a neat plant. Um, perhaps needs a little bit more training uh, in youth than we've given it. Is it naturally sprawling like this or is it ever going to go up? I, no, I, I think, <laughs> well, I don't know if the one in this location will, will ever go up just because it's, it's wanting to get out this way. Um, but no, it, in, naturally it would grow more upright. Um, Kind of as an upright multi-stem shrub it is kind of loose and open unless you do a lot of work with it um, like a lot of those kind of australian plants and new zealand plants it looks kind of twiggy or you know um, it doesn't quite uh same i guess it keeps the kangaroos from eating them or something like that um, but it does it is it has a, a heavy oil content in it uh, which may may uh, keep deer from eating it uh, too much i don't know it smells nice, though. So do plants that tolerate wet and dry, is there something different about their roots than other plants that are one or the other? Um, in some cases, it's, it means that they're not susceptible to root rots. Um, that's, that's the issue with, with many plants that are, uh, say, conifers that really prefer it on the dry side. The deal isn't that they don't like wet. It's that when they're wet soils, they're very, very susceptible to, to root rot. Um, same thing with, with some of the ericaceous plants. Uh, other plants, it's, it's a matter, it's um, because they don't need uh, as much oxygen in the soil. When you're in wet soils, there isn't a lot of oxygen. So um, take uh, taxodium is a good example that grows naturally in wet swampy spots, um, but it will take dry urban spots pretty well because it will tolerate those compacted soils. Um, it isn't so much the wet and dry as it is. It doesn't. It doesn't need the, the oxygen in the soil. Typically, a plant wants, you know, 50% solids, 25% water, 25% um, air space in, in the, its soils. And I'm sure there there are lots of other factors which contribute to <laughs> plants being able to tolerate both wet and dry that that, are, uh, that I'm not thinking of right off the top of my head. Other questions about the Leptospermum or anything else? For those of y'all in the back, when you go by, we, there's a salvia right beside it. Not to be confused with that. It's it's uh, this one right right here, uh, closest to the wall. That starts way back in the corner over there. Okay. All right. Uh, next one on the list, Euphorbia rigida, um, sometimes called the silver leaf Euphorbia or the rigid uh, Euphorbia. Um, it's this plant uh, right in here. Um, we like it kind of as a filler plant. Um, it can make a nice big patch like you see over there, or a uh, nice kind of scattered around through other things. Um, beautiful evergreen silvery foliage. Um, you can see it's it's already forming kind of the, the flower buds in here uh, uh, to show next year. It's getting a little confused. It's a little earlier than, than it should be. You see most of these are a little bit tighter held than that. Um, but. Uh, like all euphorbias, it has a very specialized uh, flower structure. And what's nice about most of them is uh, the, the um, bracts that you see that you would call the flower on this are, um, you know, kind of that uh, electric chartreuse yellow kind of color. Uh, the flowers inside that, even after the flower is, is pollinated and starts setting seed, you still have that, that bract behind there that, that really is showy over a long period. So as a flowering plant, it's very effective um, over a long, long period in, in the spring. And then after that, it's got wonderful foliage and texture and everything else. Um, Euphorbia rigida really does like this well-drained soil, although it will grow in a well-drained, um, you know, typical garden soil, not heavy clay um, so well. You can have some rot problems with that, but otherwise it, it grows pretty well and it will tend to seed about here and there a little bit in the garden but not not as an invasive plant it's not going to um, take over as, as an invasive plant but real politely through the garden um, it's uh, uh, care wise uh, the your best bet is after it flowers and the flowers no longer look good to go ahead and cut those stems all the way off and it'll put out new stems um, that keeps it looking fresh and, and uh, keeps it uh, kind of rejuvenated and happy. If you don't do that, the older stems will eventually kind of die and just look kind of ratty. Um, so you, know, you want, do want to get those out. It does have a, a little bit of a, a, a bite to it there. The leaves are succulent and they're 
if you if you stroke them the right way, they're they're okay. But they can um, poke you, especially in the summer when the the they, um, are the leaves are even more rigid than they are right now. Right now, it's kind of the best time to work with it because because they don't bite so much. Um, full sun, uh, you can do get away with a little bit of shade, but not much. Questions or thoughts? Can you get these in the nurseries here? Yeah, you Look can. for you can go. You can go online. Um, you know, mail order. You can get just about anything uh, through mail order nowadays, um, and that's and mail order companies are, are generally pretty good. Uh, you, there's a what's there's a website that ranks uh, mail order companies. I can't remember what it's called. Dave's. Is it Dave's Dave's not Dave's. There's there's another place. Um, I can't remember, but, but that that gives ratings on, on mail order nurseries. Um, Tony, Tony has that, or one just like yeah. That. yeah. I, I will say a lot of the plants in, especially the herbaceous uh, and kind of semi woody things uh, that we have here came from Plant Delights. Tony um, Tony is very into the um, these uh, uh, scree and xeric type plants and uh, has shared freely with us. So. Um, yeah, a lot of these you can get there. I have another question. Mm -hmm. Different plant. It's that cute little thing over there. This little guy? Yeah. This is agave. It's this just precious. This is uh, the, the uh, Queen Victoria agave, agave uh, Victoria originae. Really kind of interesting plant that the, the um, all the leaves kind of where they, instead of just being gently curved like most agaves, where they curve, they, you get these little white uh, uh, lines almost, like it's a crease on there. Um, and then every edge is, is outlined with white, so it gives a really interesting texture. Um, it's it, They're marginal here. It's not the best uh, agave for here by any measure. It's a small agave, uh, very uh, susceptible to winter moisture. And because it's it, the um, rosettes are held so tight, water can get down in there and you have some freeze problems and they'll rot out you know you get them get them in a great spot like this they'll last for a couple years and they often go downhill but it's still worth um, replanting um, i have seen some that are very very nice and larger and and really doing well seem if, if you have a more of a a slope that's very well drained if you plant them on that slope so they're, they're not facing straight up like this they do even better mm -hmm. how, uh, but, how about indoors Oh, indoors is a great, it's a great indoor plant. You can go on vacation for a couple weeks and not worry about it because it's an agave and we'll, we'll take it dry. Queen Victoria. Mm -hmm. Victoria Virginia. Agave Victoria Originae. Very nice little guy. Much different than, you know, some of these other great big agaves like that. Very, is that the one that died? Uh, that's the one that flowered, yeah. You know, see kind of the old stalk in the back. Um, yeah. So the main parent died on there. That's, I didn't mention that with when I was talking about the Dazzlerians, but that's one advantage Dazzlerians have over most agaves is uh, they're not monocarpic. They'll keep flowering year after year, which is kind of nice. This is Calanthes yavapensis. Just like saying yavapensis. Um, this is one of the, the sun ferns. Uh, grows... Um, down in the, the southwest uh, in, in a couple of locations. Um, it, it's, it's found in the wild, but it may be a naturally occurring hybrid uh, between a couple other species. Um, people who know more about ferns than, than me uh, uh, have said that. Um, it'll grow in full sun, really prefers a little bit of shade, but we're talking about shade in uh, you know the, the dry parts of Texas. So. Um, even when we have full sun, we've got more moisture in the air uh, that, that helps keep this going um, than, than they do down in um, Texas. Beautiful plant. The emerging fronds come out kind of curled up and silvery. Uh, they'll open up to this uh, soft mid-green. It's covered in, in really small hairs, uh, the front and back, but especially the back sides of, of the, the fronds have, have um, kind of these woolly hairs all over them. Um, if you look at the little uh, not, not fronds, but the little frondlets, the little leaflets on there, they're all kind of rounded shaped. Um, you've got to look at them up close to really see it, but, but very rounded, which is very distinctive from, from most other ones. Makes a nice little clump uh, like this. Um, great for uh, 
you know, adding a little bit of texture to a smaller garden, um, to the sun, you know, ferns are great for that, uh, and, but usually you have to put them in the shade, so it's nice to have, have this kind out here. This has been, uh, we've, we've planted a lot of calanthes out here, we still have quite a few. This has really been one of the best ones in terms of, of looking good all year round, um, really holding up. And it's got the best name, Yabapensis. <laughs> mm. Questions about this or other? Um, Would it be worth a try in regular garden soil? Or? Yeah, I think so. Um, I, I think uh, you know that, that it probably uh, would do do fine in a, uh, your average garden soil. Probably would grow pretty quickly and pretty big. That'd be my guess. Um, some of the other calanthes I know you put them in um, you put them in ordinary garden soil and they do uh, they do even better. Uh, really nice. What's the best time of year to move them? The best time of year to move. Them. Uh, if you're going to move it in an area where you can keep, where you can water it a little bit to get it established, I would say probably in the spring. Um, would, that would be my preference. Uh, pretty early spring, give it all season to, to uh, reestablish. Um, but you, you could probably move it at most any time. Ferns tend to be uh, pretty pretty adaptable that way. Uh, you know, you may want to be careful. You move it, and then two weeks later, we're getting you know down in the teens. It may not be real happy with that. But otherwise. I, you know, a real good layer of mulch would probably solve that problem. Uh, the next one is a thyme. Y'all can, can walk in front. Go in front, front. go in front, look. Um, <laughs> and this is a thyme. This is Thymus masticaina. Uh, it's a, um, it's endemic to, uh, to Spain, to the Iberian Peninsula. Uh, it's, it's kind of a, a shrubby thyme. You know, many of the thymes we think about are uh, like these over here, these low growing, um, creeping uh, uh, times, but the thymus masticaina is more of a, a subshrub with woody stems growing upright. Typically, uh, small clusters of white flowers, but it can have pink flowers as well. Uh, anybody who's into um, essential oils and aromatics, here you get oil of marjoram. Have ever heard of oil of marjoram? It's not from marjoram; it's from thymus masticaina. <laughs> Good figure. It's, um, you know, tea made from this is, is widely used as an antiseptic, as a, you know, a cold preventative. You can gargle with it if you have a sore throat. It has all kinds of wonderful properties, I'm told. Uh, I, I grew up with a physician for a doctor, so I'm all about, you know, better living through chemistry. But this, this natural stuff, <laughs> people swear by it. Um, so, so probably pretty good. Um, easy to, to harvest. You can use it culinarily as thyme, but it's, it's not your best thyme for that. You really want you know, thyme is sufficient alice for that or one of the other ones. Um, but you can use it for that, and it does smell like thyme. Uh, somewhat like thyme. Uh, the best time to harvest it is just if you want oils for it, if you want it for, for that, or you want it for drying for tea or anything like that, is just before it flowers. Um, when it's got the, the flower buds on there, that's when you harvest it um, because after it flowers, it puts so much of the energy into the, the flower production, the seed production, um, that, that it's not creating all those oils and those types of things. So um, you do want to do that. Uh, herbs like this that are very aromatic, if you have a sunny garden, they're, they're, um, they're one of the best ways to, to deal with uh, deer. Um, you know, the deer will tend to go to your neighbor's yard and eat their plants if you have lots of these aromatic type plants um, with, with lots of, of oils in them. Uh, as you can see, if, you, if it likes the space, it will kind of seed around a little bit. Um, I like how they've done this. It kind of seems to seed into uh, a spot and the, the other, the creeping thyme kind of seeds around it and you have, have uh, uh, both growing together everywhere. Um, kind of nice. How cold tolerant is that? How cold tolerant is it? Um, in in cold zone seven winters here, in cold winters, uh, it will get some damage, uh, but it will recover. Um, so I don't think it would go much colder than than, than Raleigh. Mm. This is a uh, this little guy is uh, a soapwort. Some of you may be familiar with Saponaria officinalis. If you've ever planted that in your garden, you may have regretted it after it spread everywhere and uh, went crazy. This is one uh, from Cyprus. It's endemic to the island of Cyprus, and anything that's still growing on Cyprus and combating the, the goats is uh, a tough plant because um, the goats have pretty much devastated everything. Makes uh, low mats of this blue, uh, bluish foliage, uh, two, three inches tall, just spreads uh, kind of flat, 
but then it puts up uh, five, six inch uh, flower stalks with, with compared to the, the foliage and the side of the plant, these fairly large pink flowers, um, uh, soapwort, saponaria type flowers with kind of a nice uh, uh, fuzzy red calyx uh, behind it, which even after the flowers drop, those calyxes stay above the foliage and, and add some ornamental interest. It's evergreen, uh, makes a nice mound. I think it's a, a great uh, kind of alternative to some of the dianthus. Um, if you want something a little different than that, and something that flowers later. One of the great things about this is it flowers in midsummer, uh, when you know there's in the sun. There's not a lot going on a lot of times, especially nice pink. You know, you start to get more of those real hot, uh, saturated colors uh, in midsummer. So this is nice for that that blue foliage and those, those pink flowers. Above. So, but a good good combination with the creeping dianthus can get that same kind of blue foliage, pink flower, just, just extends it later in the season, uh, in July and sometimes August. Does want well drained soil. That one, for the, for the question of can you get these plants, that one's one that's a little bit tougher. Tougher to find. But you can find them. Question is. It doesn't seed around like like the the common cycle. Yeah, it's, um, it's pretty uh pretty tame in that respect. Although it does it collect seed from it, it does germinate pretty easily uh, from seed. Put in a, a well drained mix, and it does grow from seed easily. All right, one more, and I'm going to tell you as we go through here, and you smell licorice. It's uh, kind of this upright plant at the ends of the beds. It's not on the list because it's not really uh, uh, looking so great right now. But it's one that's kind of killed back at the end. It's a marigold. It's a perennial marigold. Tagiti's loose enough to sweet marigold. And it does smell uh, like liquor. You're fine. This one. This one. Thank you. Smell the foliage. This morning, uh, when I was out, I mean, it was very, very strong. In front. <laughs> this is a, a cartoon, which is uh, basically a glorified artichoke. Um, Cynara cardunculus. Uh, this is one called, um, what is it, Porto? Porto spineless. Um, cartoons are, are these wonderful uh, Mediterranean um, thistle relatives. Uh, they're biennials to perennial, depending on how you treat them, uh, but technically biennials. Make these wonderful clumps of, of um, silvery, bold uh, uh, foliage uh, the first year from seed. So these were seed from uh, uh, this past spring. They were, they were grown out of seedlings. Make these wonderful clumps. And then this coming year, they'll flower. And when they flower, all of a sudden they'll get huge. They'll, they'll uh, get eight feet tall and have, the, have great big... Uh, um, purple thistle like flowers on top. If you don't let it go to seed, if you cut them back, they'll stay alive. But if you let them go to seed, they'll, they'll really start to go downhill and often often die. Um, they're, they're spectacular plants. You can see that one's that one looks like it might not be Porto spineless. It's got a little bit broader leaf. The Porto spineless has a, a narrow leaf like this, and it was bred for a cut flower industry, so it doesn't have spines on the flower stems like a lot of the cardoons do which make them a little bit unpleasant to, um, to deal with if you're having to deal with a lot of them. Not a problem in the garden, but um, this Porto Spineless we found to be pretty nice. Um, they will typically be evergreen for us here. Uh, they'll, they'll look beautiful. We'll get a really cold snap and they'll kind of flop to the ground, but they'll usually pop back up. Um, sometimes if you get a lot of that over the winter, they can get some damage and you have to cut back the leaves some. But then once they start growing again in the, um, in the spring, they, they, I mean, they go quick uh, from, from the root. Um, I know, I have heard of people eating cardoon, the buds of cardoon, kind of like an artichoke. Um, it, looking at the flower, comparing it to an artichoke, it seems like it would have a lot of that choke from the artichoke in there and not a whole lot of anything else. So I, I don't know who exactly would want to do that, but, uh, you know, I guess you could try it if, if you want. Questions about these? What kind of soil? Well-drained soils. Uh, they naturally grow in really rocky areas, um, alkaline soils. Uh, but I've grown them in, in uh, typical garden soil. I've, they want full sun, but I've grown them in um, beds with annuals where we were putting on the water, we're putting on the fertilizer, uh, 
so all the other annuals would, would really go and flower and it didn't phase them a bit they just got bigger and bigger in, in, in where they were where I've planted them in areas where we really do fertilize and have heavy fertility you lose some of the silveriness of them the, the hairs on the leaves tend to fall off a little bit more and you get more of a, a green leaf than that silver leaf but otherwise um, no problems so if you harvest the flowers fairly quickly before they really open up and, what, and will it continue to it, flower? It or? will continue to flower if you cut the flowers off early. Um, I don't know how long it will. And if you cut the, once the flowers fade and, and are starting to look like a weedy thistle, if you cut, cut the flower stalks back then, then um, typically your plant will stay alive. I've, I've had these alive for five or six years. Now they will die at some point. They're not long lived. Uh, they want to be biennials. They want to, you know, grow, flower the second year, set seed and die, and, and if they do that you can collect the seed and re-sow it, but if you cut off the flowers you can keep them growing for, going for pretty, for fairly long. Other comments or thoughts? Alright, well thank y'all all for coming. Thank you, Mark.